Hello, I'm Walt Jury. Thank you for joining us at Community on Demand. Today, Dan continues his series of seven sermons he has titled, The Seven Habits of Highly Ineffective People, taken from the book of Exodus. This series is intended to help us break destructive habits that can cause us to become ineffective and waste our lives. Today's sermon, the third in the series, is titled, The Habit of Loving Gold More Than God. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Dan begins. You know, on Sunday, May the 12th, 1907, a lady by the name of Annie Jarvis decided to do a memorial service for her mom in her mom's church. Well, the idea caught on. Other people started doing that. And within five years, President Woodrow Wilson declared the second Sunday of every May as a national holiday, Mother's Day. And Mother's Day, what I think is so fascinating about this is that Mother's Day originated in a Christian church in the United States of America. It's a Christian holiday. And it has spread throughout the whole world, and it had its origins right here. So I'm really thankful that we're able to, to take a Sunday and, and just say thank you to moms. In fact, it, by all means, the Christian faith lifts women to the highest esteem more than all other faith systems out there. And, and so, ladies, thank you for all that you do. And thank you for being here in church on Sunday morning. I think that's a, te- a wonderful testimony. But there seems to be, even though we celebrate Mother's Day, even though it is a Christian holiday, there seems to be a disregard and even a disdain among some of the most elite people uh, in America toward God and the Christian church. And it seems to be growing today. In fact, I did a little research this week just to kind of do a survey of the faith of some of our most elite people here in the United States, our billionaires, so to speak. So let me just kind of give you uh, what I discovered. There's Elon Musk. He's been in the news here lately, who's at the top of the list, the richest man in the world, worth $249 billion, and he claims to be irreligious. That's his claim to faith. Jeff Bezos, number two, founded Amazon. His net worth is $150 billion. He says that he has, there's no testimony and there's no statement of his religious faith. Then there's Bill Gates. We all know Bill Gates, who's worth $129 million. And in an interview, here's what he stated. He said, I'm not someone who goes to church on a regular basis. The specific elements of Christianity are not something I am a huge believer in. Warren Buffett, worth $115 billion. He is an avowed agnostic. <laughs> I find that as an, an avowed, I don't know what I am, you know, agnostic. Mark Zuckerberg, worth $76 billion. A Jewish atheist claims to have become more religious here lately since he's had children. And that would that'd drive you to religion, okay? George Soros, an anti-Semitic Jew, states, I'm not religious, I do not believe in God. Here's the thing. God allowed each and every one of these men to become billionaires. And yet, as they began to amass wealth, they began to develop the habit of loving gold more than God. That's the title of my sermon today. And, and, you know, I often wonder what I would do if I were a billionaire. You ever thought that? I think, well, I think one of the things I might do is that I might fund this upcoming 
building expansion that we're going to be talking about next, next uh, <laughs> hint, 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 you know. Uh, uh, would I do that? W- would, I, would I help fund some of the struggling church plants that are trying to get going out here in our area? W- would, I, um, uh, would I give more to missions? W- w- would, I, um, would I help fund seminaries like GSOT over here? Uh, would I um, would I help feed hungry children abroad, or as I begin to amass wealth, would I develop the habit of these guys of loving gold more than God? And I, I think we all think those thoughts, especially when we don't have that kind of money. <laughs> but we think, uh, especially if we love the Lord and we, and we care about people and we care about lost people and we love ministry, some of us think, if I had a billion dollars, what would I do with it? Would I put a million in the building fund? Hint, 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 again. <laughs> what, would I, would I, uh, what would I do? Oh, by the way, let me just say this. Some of you don't need to be a, a, a billionaire. Some of you are already uh, giving and, uh, unbelievably. You know, back in February, we had our annual meeting and we, we, we made a giant leap of faith by saying we want to raise $50,000 for missions this year and, and give that to missions projects. We're in the third quarter, just finished the third quarter. Already we've been able to raise around $70,000 and distribute it to, to mission projects. And so give yourself a hand, okay? You guys have done a good job there. Here's the question. Do we love God more than gold, or have we developed the habit of loving gold more than God? Now, before we try to answer that question, let's see what the Scripture says about loving gold. And, and of course, you know I'm talking about money, about loving money. In, in 2 Timothy, Paul's writing to, to Timothy. In 1 Timothy, Paul's writing. In verse number 6, he says, here, he says this, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And to many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Here it does not say, I want you to understand something. It does not say that money is the root of all evil. Did you catch that? It says that the love of money is, the, is a root of all kinds of, e- uh, of evil. When we begin loving money more than God, we tend to move away from God and toward things that will draw us into to evil. And in the book of Exodus, where we've been studying, we see an example of this with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt and began their Exodus journey. God gave them lots of gold and silver and other things. He loaded them down with, with all kinds of material things as they left the country of Egypt. With this gold, they had provision, there were plans and then ultimately there was some perversion attached to the goal. Let's go in, uh, to Exodus and study uh, for just a little bit this morning. And I want you to see the provision of their goal. So some of us think that we're self-made financial gurus, okay? But look, look I want to take us all the way back to Exodus chapter 3 and see where the Israelites got their financial substance. In, in, in Exodus 3.21, it says, we're going to do a lot of reading today. A lot of reading, less preaching. So uh, a lot, lot, of, lot, lot of scripture to cover. So in, in Exodus 3.21, God is saying, I will give the people favor. Talking about the Egyptians. He said, I will give this people favor in the sight of the, the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty handed, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. 
Egypt was the wealthiest country on, on earth during this period of time. Uh, and, and they received their wealth from the conquest of other countries, from the, uh, the, the agricultural um, uh, industry in the, in the, in the Egypt uh, Nile Delta. And so they're very, very wealthy. Uh, in fact, we've been able to see this in some of the archaeological studies. And, and for instance, in King Tutankhamun's tomb, we see some of the enormous Egyptian wealth. His coffin weighed over a ton, and it was made of solid gold. Some of you may have, some of you may have seen the display when it came here. It is estimated that the gold in King Tut's, in King Tut's tomb is worth $79 million. God made Egypt and Pharaoh wealthy and powerful. In fact, Romans 9, 17 says this, For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name will be declared in all of the earth. That's a declaration by Paul in Romans. Back to Exodus chapter 12. It says, Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of gold, art, uh, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they granted them what they requested, and they plundered the Egyptians. After centuries of being the wealthiest nation on earth, they They just gave it all away to these Israelite slaves as they were exiting the country. Of course, you you know the story of the the ten plagues and and what had happened. And they were begging the Israelites to leave. And they literally left with carts full of gold and silver and bronze and articles of of clothing. and, and, And it says they plundered Egypt. God provided it. God motivated the Egyptians. God made the Egyptians wealthy and motivated the Egyptians to make Israel wealthy as she left. So what did they need all this gold and silver and, 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 and articles of, of uh, bronze? And what, what did they need that for? Well, let's look at the plan down in Exodus 25 as we skip down a few chapters. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Are you ready for this? Gold, silver, bronze, purple, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair. Ram's skin dyed red, badger skin, a kale wood, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod, and the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. God had plans for the children of Israel as they were leaving Exodus. His plan was to dwell among them and he made them wealthy so that when they got into the wilderness, he could give them a plan to make the tabernacle. By the way, the tabernacle, if you begin reading the plans, it, it had cedar wood walls overlaid in gold. It had furnishings that were made out of gold. It had lighting that was made out of a solid gold candle abra. It had the the Ark of the Covenant that was overlaid in gold with two golden angels on either side of, of, the, of the tabernacle. And what he wanted to happen is he wanted the children of Israel to share with him the development of the tabernacle, the, the putting together 
of the worship place, the sanctuary in the wilderness. He wanted them to be involved with him. And so he provided everything for the tabernacle in the wilderness. God wanted Israel to become a part of this magnificent building program. So he supplied them, he supplied them with the material the year before the building program was to begin. God provided it. God had plans for it. But sadly, you know the story of the perversion of their goal. Let's read it starting in verse 32. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered to Aaron and said to him, come make us gods that we shall go before, uh, that shall go before us. Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters. Bring them to me. So all the people broke off the earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molten calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Say what? They used the gold that was supposed to be used for the tabernacle to make a golden calf. The cow was the holiest animal in Egypt in so much the the Egyptians worshipped the cow and the bull. Doesn't that sound stupid? While Moses is receiving the plans for the tabernacle up on Mount Sinai, he's got the architectural plans drawn out before him. He's probably thinking golden walls. My goodness, he's thinking about that while he's while he's receiving the plans the children of Israel had made the transition of loving gold more than God, taken their gold, fashioned it into a golden cow, calf, and began to fall down and worship and say, it's you that brought us out of the land of Israel. I would call that mass delusion, wouldn't you? Sounds like insanity to me. However, on this Mother's Day, I believe God is leading us toward a facility expansion. There just seems to be energy building for that so that we can reach youth, children, families, and help families in our area with the gospel. And and if we follow the example of Israel, of loving gold more than God, I'm, I'm I'm afraid some things can happen to us that we would never dream in a million years. That happened to them. So, so uh, there are about three things that could happen if we begin to take, and God has blessed us. As, as we begin to take the blessing that God has given us, we begin to look at it. We begin to love it. We begin to cherish the blessing more than the blesser. Here are the three things that can happen. Number one, we could lose our vision. Look down to verse 32, verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come make us gods that we should go before us. For for as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Without Moses' leadership, who I think is the greatest leader in the Old Old Testament, when you look at all that he did, without his leadership, they lost sight of their vision. What was their vision? What drove them to leave the land of Egypt in the first place? Their, Their vision was to go to the promised land that flowed with milk and honey to get out from under the bondage of Egyptian slavery, to quit working tirelessly, to quit having to sacrifice their baby boys and go to the land that God had promised them. That was their vision. But without Moses keeping the vision before them at all times, they lost sight 
of the vision. They couldn't see the promised land. They were looking at the pretty earrings, the bracelets. And their vision began to change. And, uh, and, and just before the destruction of their nation, and by the way, they'll go through several hundred years and then they will lose their nation. But just before the destruction of their nation in 605 BC, God sends a message to the prophet Ezekiel concerning what has happened. Let me read you that message. You can read along with me. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 17 through 18. <clears throat> you have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold, my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your em embroidered garments and covered them, and, and you set my oil and my incense before them. Also my food, which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour, oil, and honey, which I fed you, you set it before them as sweet incense. That's what it was, saith the Lord God. God saying, you've taken everything that I've blessed you with. You've pulled it away and you've given it to the thing that you really love, materialism. God's. Gods of gold and silver. I said this a moment ago. Let me say it again. God has blessed us. We do not deserve how God has blessed us. He has blessed our church. He has given us land. You see all these trees out here? This is, we own all of that. God owns it. He is loaning it. <laughs> okay. He's given us finances. It's unbelievable. We're going, to do, we're going to have a meeting next Sunday night after church. It will blow your mind what God has been doing uh, as far as finance. He's given us talent. I mean, talent is walking in the door and, and, and doing ministry. I'm just saying, uh, someone was talking about the way the, the, that the Lord is blessing our church in so many ways right now. And, and I made the comment. I said, I just had to step out of the way and let God just do what God does, you know. And, 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 and he's doing that. He has blessed us in so many ways. And um, he, he's, uh, he's given us good leadership. And if we're not careful, we will lose our mission and we'll lose our vision. What is our mission? To provide an environment that draws people to Christ, equipping them to lead others. What is our vision? To, to see a flourishing community of believers Drawing youth, drawing children, drawing families to where they can come and hear the gospel of Christ, trust Christ as their Savior, and live out their lives in abundance. That is our vision. <clears throat> However, if we begin to fall back, if we begin to start loving what God has given us, we could lose our vision. What's worse, we could lose our youth. We could lose our children to this world, to this woke culture that is aggressively going after them in every single way, including some of the, some of the, some of the things like Disneyland. I, I mean, there's an aggressive move, and if, and if we're not careful, we'll begin to lose these things. So we can lose our vision. The second thing, we might lessen our virtues we we'll begin to love God more than gold. Look down at verse 21, chapter 32. Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? So Aaron said, do not let the anger of the Lord become so hot. You know the people. They are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that will go before us as for this Moses, the, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has gold, let them break them off. So I, they gave it to me. I cast it into the fire, and this cow came out. Aaron, you're going to be the high priest. You're lying. You've lost it. 
You're blaming them, not you. You had a lapse of leadership here. You caved. And, and, and what happens to us, if we're not careful, we begin to move in that direction, especially when we have a lapse of leadership. We fudge, we lie, we cover, we blame. Isn't that the way we do? There's a psychologist by the name of Paul Ekman, and he says there's nine reasons we lie. I'm not going to give you all nine of them, but let me give you a few. Some include, we lie to avoid punishment. We lie to get out of an awkward situation. We lie to avoid embarrassment, and we lie to win admiration. When we begin loving the blessing more than the blesser, we are in danger of compromising our standards and our virtues, especially in the area of honesty and transparency. We try to cover ourselves. We could lose our vision. We could lessen our virtues. And we may well lose our values. Look down in verse 25. Moses saw the people that they were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among the enemies. The text uses the word unrestrained, which means out of control. Some translations also have it as uncovered. Without godly leadership, they had lost control. They began to lose their values. It appears that they were uncovered as they danced around the golden calf. They had lost control. We can tell that we're beginning to love gold more than God when we find ourselves going down this track, losing our vision. We can't, I mean, we're just now in a routine. We just do what we do because that's what we do, you know. We don't have vision anymore. We know we're going down that track. When we get to compromise our standards and our virtues, ah, it's not so bad. We might be going down that track. When we begin to lose our values, the things that we held so valuable before, like we value people, we care about people, when we start losing that, chances are we've turned our attention away f- from God and toward gold. Let me, let me give you a, a, you say, well, what do we do? How do we turn this thing around? We can see how that happens. It's happening to me. It's happened to me. I've had to get back on track. So how do you do, how do you, how do we turn this around where we're loving God more than gold, more than money, more than things? I'll tell you a story about someone. You've probably heard this story, but, but um, it's the story of John D. Rockefeller. As a youth, growing up as a teenager, he was strong. He was husky. He was athletic. He, he was a competitor. And he discovered while he was very young that he had a knack for making money. And and he began working toward that. And and by the time that he was 33 years old, he had made his first million dollars. At 43, he controlled the largest oil company in the world. At 53... He was the richest man on earth, and he was the world's only billionaire. Now there's about a thousand of them living here, you know, in the United States. At 53, that's when he developed an illness called, I hope I say this right, a a, a lapia. Anybody want to help me? A lapia. I don't know, tilapia, who knows? (laughs) His hair fell out. I don't have it, so I don't ever know, you know. Alopecia. I learned something right here today. His eyebrows disappeared. His eyelashes fell out. He couldn't eat. Couldn't sleep. 
In fact, the only thing that he could digest was milk and crackers. Richest man on earth can enjoy a steak, you know. And the doctors predicted that by the time that he reached age 54, that he would die. He wasn't going to make it. In fact, the, the, uh, the newspaper there in Philadelphia had pre-written his obituary so that they would be the first to get the news out when, 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 the, when, the, when the time came. And he lay there at night, not being able to sleep, and he began to think of all the things that I own, I'm not going to take any of this with me. None of it. In fact, he wasn't sure about where he's going to go. And he wrestled and wrestled throughout the night. And finally, he looked up to the Lord and he said, Lord, I'm going to ask Christ to come into my life. I need a change. And that night, he gave his life to the Lord. He surrendered his life to the Lord. The next morning, he did, some, he did something very unusual. He, he went down, he woke into a man, and, and he began to help churches. He began just to, to find churches that were struggling, and he began to send money to them. <clears throat> he, uh, uh, he established the, the Rockefeller Foundation for medical research. It, by the way, that, that led to the discovery of penicillin, this guy here. He began, to te- he, he began attending weekly worship. He began attending prayer meetings. He started a Bible study in his own home. Doctors had predicted that he would die by the age of 54. He lived to be 98 years old. At age 53, he gave $1 million away, and he continued doing that every year. Each year thereafter, by the age of 80, he had given away $138 million. By 98, he had given away a total of $550 million. On this Mother's Day, if you are struggling with a lack of joy, happiness, it could be that you're loving Gold more than God. And gold will not love you back. In fact, scriptures say that it develops wings and tends to fly away. Mine does. Does yours? So let me leave you with, so, so Israel is an example to us. That is, and Israel in, the, in, in the, their exodus from Egypt is an example of what not to do. So let me leave you with a closing passage uh, that Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, but this I say, he who spares, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound that you, to, uh, uh, toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God has blessed my life and Gala's life with an abundance as we continue to let that flow through us. God- On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link, www.cbcwoodlands.org. I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.